Yeah, thanks a lot, David, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for joining this talk. So yeah, it's uh, Jean Cossefi. It's a French name. So and yeah, today I'll be talking to you about how to combine tensor methods with deep learning. So I guess, yeah, the main thing in modern deep learning and modern machine learning is that most of the data we manipulate is inherently multidimensional. So if we think, for example, MRI or functional MRI, so all this kind of data has a lot of spatial temporal and topological structure and leveraging that structure is crucial for good learning. And so the aim of this topic is seeing how we can use tensor methods to leverage that structure and move away from typical matrix algebraic methods and instead use uh, tensor methods. And so for all purposes of this talk by tensors, I simply mean multidimensional arrays and uh, the order of a tensor is, is number of dimension. So I really like this slide by Charles Van Loon, where he kind of illustrated the shift in the level of thinking from scalar level thinking to matrix level thinking in the 80s and today tensor level thinking. And so that kind of led him to say that tensors are the next big thing. And so in the context of deep learning, why are tensors the next big thing? Because they can give us several things, including compression, so large reduction in the number of parameters, but also speed ups through more efficient operations improved performance and generalization through better inductive biases and also better robustness, whether that's to noise or to things like adversarial attacks or domain shifts. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction to tensor decompositions to make sure we're all on the same page. So the core operation of tensor methods is tensor contraction, which kind of generalizes the concept of matrix with matrix or matrix with vector product. So if we contract a matrix with a vector, we take a linear combination of its columns and we contract over one dimension. So the result is a vector. So the same thing can be done for tensors and that's called the N mode product where we're contracting a tensor with a matrix or a vector along its nth mode or dimension. And in that case, the result is a linear combination of the slices that compose the tensor. And of course we can contract a tensor with two or more matrices or vectors. So here we contract a third order tensor with two vectors. So we contract over two dimensions and the result is a multilinear combination of the fibers that compose the tensors. And so using the tensor contraction, we can generalize other operations such as matrix decomposition to higher orders. So in the matrix case, um, if we have a matrix, we can express it as a sum of rank one matrices. So each rank one matrix is now a product of two vectors. And this can be generalized to tensors and that's the canonical polyadic decomposition, sometimes also called parafac. And then the idea is the same. You take the original tensor and you express it as a sum of rank one tensors. Well, now a rank one tensor is now a product of three vectors or more. There are other kinds of uh, tensor decompositions. So I'm only going to introduce the, the ones we're going to use. So the Tucker decomposition, for example, also called higher order SVD or higher order PCA sometimes, expresses a source tensor as a small core tensor, which can be thought of as spanning a latent subspace, like for the PCA in the matrix case. And we have a set of factors, typically autonormal, that can project to and from that subspace and back to the original tensor. And finally, the other most ubiquitous tensor decomposition is probably called the tensor train decomposition, introduced by Ivan Oslodet to the machine learning field. And if you come from physics, you probably know it as the matrix product state. And there the idea is you take your original tensor and express it as a sequence of third order cores or uh, which can kind of form a train of tensors, hence the name. And so just to briefly mention um, implementations, um, tensor methods in general are quite powerful and have been widely used in several fields, but there kind of has been a lag in their use in machine learning. And one of the reasons is perhaps a steeper learning curve, but also a lack of available implementation in Python and difficulty of implementing some of these methods in practice. And so that's why we introduced Tensorly, which is a high level API for tensor methods in Python with the goal of democratizing tensors. So it's open source and we have a large community of contributors from all over the world and we welcome any contributions. So the idea is simply to kind of build on top of a flexible backend system, which allows to transparently run code written intensely with any framework, such as NumPy, PyTorch, et cetera. And on top of this uh, backend, we implement tensor algebraic operations, such as element product, et cetera. And finally, tensor decompositions and regression. So 
it essentially gives an easy and flexible interface to tensor methods. So you can easily form tensors in decomposed form, reconstruct the full tensor, do n mode, um, n -mode product and other operations. And when you have a, any tensor, you can also easily apply tensor decomposition with an API that's similar to that of scikit-learn. So here, for example, you can create a random tensor of size four by five by three, and you create an instance of a CP decomposition of rank 12, and you can simply fit that decomposition to your tensor to get a CP decomposition. And as you can see, the reconstruction error is of course very small. So now that we have this um, tool of tensor decomposition, we can apply this to neural networks by decomposing, for example, the parameters of the model. So probably the first use of tensor methods within um, neural networks was, was done by Alexander Novikov et al in a NeurIPS uh, paper where they proposed to tensorize the matrix parameterizing fully connected layers. So if you have a fully connected layer parameterized by a matrix of size I1 by I2 by I3, for the number of rows in J1, J2, J3 for number of columns, you can tensorize it by reshaping it into a higher order tensor where each dimension or mode jointly parameterizes part of the input and part of the outputs. You can then decompose that tensor, for example, using tensor train. And during inference, you can directly contract the activation tensor with the factors of the decomposition. And you can also um, fine tune or optimize directly with respect to the cores of the decomposition. So that kind of results in large compression ratios, but also uh, better performance. So that's actually also known as MPO in um, physics and we can come back later to this. So another way to incorporate tensor operations in deep neural networks is actually take um, operations that natively operate on tensors and incorporate them as layers in deep neural networks. So in a traditional uh, approach, you would have a batch of images, for example, if you're doing computer vision, and you would pass them through a series of convolutions, pooling and nonlinearities, which would give you an activation tensor representing the input and its structure. And typically the structure is discarded by passing it through a flattening uh, layer and then a series of fully connected layers. And this combination of flattening and fully connected layers not only discards the topological structure, it also results in large number of parameters. So instead, we can preserve the multilinear structure by using tensor regression layers and directly predict the outputs by contracting the activation tensor with some low rank regression weights. So here, the regression weights are represented as a low rank tensor in factorized form, for example, here at Tucker form. And so in addition to preserving the multilinear structure in the inputs, uh, tensor regression layers require less parameters and they can also reduce the, so they can reduce the number of parameters without hurting performance. So here, for example, we took a ResNet 101, uh, we replaced flattening and fully connected layers with a tensor regression layer and on, trained on the ImageNet. And as you can see, there's a large region for which we can decrease the number of parameters without hurting accuracy. And so, so far we've seen how to um, parameterize fully connected layers or replace them, but really the main success of deep convolutional neural networks is due to convolutions. And so let's first have a, a quick refresher. Um, so if a convolutional layer, what essentially all you're doing is you take an image, you convolve it with a feature and you get a feature map. So if your input has several channels, you will need one filter for each channel, which results in a 3D kernel. And so in practice, we're learning a bank of filters. So we now have a four dimensional tensor, which is of size, a number of input channels times the number of output channels times the heights times the width. And you can also additionally have the, the time dimension. So that's a prime candidate to apply tensor decomposition. And there's been a, a few work doing exactly this. So, you can, for example, apply Tucker decomposition or CP decomposition. And in both cases, you get a reduction of the number of parameters. But what's really interesting is that there are deep ties between tensor decomposition applied to a convolutional kernel and efficient convolutional blocks. So if you apply Tucker decomposition to a convolution, for example, you can get um, ResNet bottleneck block. And if you apply CP, you can get a MobileNet V2 block. And that's not only the only advantage. So another thing you can do is once you have this um, CP structure on your convolution, what you've essentially done, you've 
disentangled the modes of variation of the convolution. And so you get a separable convolution. So you can train such a se separable convolution. So you, you can train a 2D network with a convolution in this factorized form in the 2D domain, for example, for prediction on, from static images. And then you can apply transduction to generalize to 3D. Jean, there's a question yeah. by Joseph uh, in the chat. I will ask him to unmute. Yeah, can you, thanks. Can you explain um, precisely what you're doing mathematically when you're saying you're doing 2D convolution or 3D separable convolution? Right, so I, yeah, I didn't actually um, write the equations here um, because it, yeah, it doesn't look great on the slides, but essentially, um, yeah, that's what I was trying to explain here. So the, first, there are discrete uh, convolutions because we're doing it over images. And so the idea is you take a filter, which is, for example, a three by three filter, and you take the inner product with um, each patch of the image. And you kind of slide your filter across the image to get a response map. And so you have as many filters as you have input channels. And in practice, you learn a bank of filters. So you learn K kind of convolutions. And so that's one convolutional layer. So I'm sorry, I'm a little ignorant of the terminology. So what is the filter is what again? Um, so if you're, if you're training on images, it's just like a matrix of size three by three, for example. So it's um, just a come? filter, essentially. So like where a simple thing matrix? would be like a Sobel filter if you're trying to get the gradients of the image, except here we're essentially learning the weights of the convolution end to end. So just, yeah, so how do you get these matrices that you use for your filter? Yeah, that's a great question. So they're just learned end-to-end -end as part of the learning process. So we kind of initialize them randomly, for example, with a Gaussian distribution, and then we learn through gradient backpropagation. Okay, thanks. I'm getting there. Still not there yet, though. Yeah, happy, happy to chat more after, after the talk. But yeah, essentially the goal is to, instead of using handcrafted features like was done previously in computer vision, we're now learning end-to-end -end these filters. So typically before we'd have done something like histograms of oriented gradients, all these kind of things. Now we're just learning end-to-end -end this um, convolutional layers. And so yeah, once we have this uh, factorized form, we can train on a 2D domain because we have this, uh, so we have this decomposed form and we can simply add a new factor to then generalize to, um, for example, the 3D domain or the spatial temporal domain. And so this is particularly useful as it allows us to leverage representation we learn in the static domain and fine tune to incorporate temporal variation and do well on, for example, video prediction tasks. So, Another aspect of this is okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. there's another question uh, by uh, Vasilescu. Now, um, I, if you raise your hand, it's easier for me to unmute you, but I can also read it out. The question is, what are you optimizing to learn the filters? I see. So, yeah, if you're doing image prediction, for example, we would have um, a crescent cross entropy loss or any kind of optimization problem. So we, we're trying to, for example, we have a bunch of images. We're trying to predict uh, what kind of what object is contained on the image. That's the image net problem. And we simply optimize this loss. And then we optimize all the layers through uh, gradient by propagation. So it depends on the problem. But typically for vision, that would be a image classification or image segmentation, this kind of task. Great, and so, yeah, so this, this factorization re, uh, results in less parameters, but also um, less number of operations. So here that's the number of uh, gigaflops, so the number of um, operations. And uh, as you can see, like a 3D convolution has much more parameters than a separable convolution, even when the rank is high. So here, for example, uh, we selected a rank equal to six times the number of input channels or three times the number of input channels, which is quite typical. And we still have, um, less than half the number of uh, flops, of gigaflops of a regular convolution. And so we applied this um, to continuous emotion estimation from uh, images. So we tried to predict uh, levels of valence and arousal, where valence is how positive or negative the state of mind is, and arousal how exciting or calming the experiences. So we have uh, videos of people and we try to kind of predict their emotional state. 
And so there, one challenge is that there is quite a lot of annotated images, but we have much less annotated videos because it's quite costly to get experts to annotate each frame. So there, what we did is we first trained the network in factorized form on the 2D domain, and we then applied transduction to generalize to videos where we have less annotated data. And so using this technique, we were able to get a model that had better performance, but much less parameters. And so I just want to mention briefly, because conceptually so far we've leveraged redundancies in the parameter tensor of a single convolutional layer. And this redundancy can arises as a result of overparameterization, which was shown to be crucial for training deep neural networks by a stochastic gradient descent. But in the same way, we would want to leverage redundancies not only within the layer, but within an entire network. So we tried this um, for a task of um, body pose estimation. And in that case, we're able to form a network such that the convolutions all had the same size. And we packed them all in a single tensor, which we jointly compressed. So in, in other words, we can kind of pack all the convolutions in a single high order tensor and jointly compress it. And we're able to get uh, large compression ratios without any loss of performance on tasks such as a body pose estimation of semantic phase segmentation. But really the main advantage is that we can then use the structure for things like domain adaptation. And so there the goal is that we want to learn, the, we have learned a model on the source domain, say ImageNet classification. So classification of um, images for given classes. And as new data becomes incrementally available for other tasks, we want to specialize the model to perform well on this new task without losing performance on the original tasks. And so one way to do this is once we have this network parameterized with a higher order tensor, if we have, for example, a Tucker structure on this tensor, we can now consider the core of the Tucker decomposition as task agnostic, so shared between all the tasks, uh, which could represent a shared knowledge subspace. And then for each new task, we should simply learn a new set of autonormal factors to project from this um, shared knowledge subspace to each new task we're trying to learn on. And so this, we showed that this um, can perform really well in terms of number of parameters, but also in terms of performance, because we can now leverage um, knowledge we learned on previous tasks and specialize on the new tasks. And so the last aspect I mentioned at the beginning of the talk is robustness. And so there was, has been a lot of work to show that low rank tensor factorization acts as an implicit regularization on the network. So there's a lot of work, for example, from Nadav Cohen on this subject. And so that improves general generalization and robustness. But we can further leverage the low rank structure from these tensor factorizations by working on the latent subspace spanned by the decomposition. So first, the kind of noises we get in um, deep learning are typically lossy, due to lossy transmission, noisy capture, or adversarial attack. And so adversarial attacks consist of um, an adversary taking an image, so here a panda, and adding a small amount of noise, typically imperceptible to the human eye, but that will cause the network to misclassify the image with high confidence. So here, the image with the noise looks the same to us, but the network misclassifies it as a given with high confidence. So this has been applied to various fields. For example, you can print these adversarial attacks and uh, cause a um, network for human detection to not detect the person. And so one uh, thing that's typically used for robustness is, tense, is, uh, is dropout. And so the key idea of dropout is to drop connections, but that induces sparsity on the activations and changes statistic. So instead we could apply dropout in the latent subspace of the decomposition. So for example, for tensor dropout on the CP decomposition, we can randomly drop the components of the CP decomposition before reconstructing the full weights. So here we have a tensor expressed as a CP uh, in the CP form, so a linear combination of rank one tensors, and we can keep each rank one component with probability P and drop it with probability one minus P, so according to a Bernoulli distribution. So the same thing can be done uh, for a Tucker form, in which case now we have a sketching matrix, which is diagonal with Bernoulli entries. And we can also use other kinds of um, other probabilities. But essentially, that means that the network now no longer can rely on a single component to perform the decomposition. And so that typically 
results in better performance. So here again, we are doing image classification um, with a tensor regression layer, and we additionally added tensor dropout, and we saw that performance can increase when we add this tensor dropout. But also, it, in addition to improved generalization, it makes the model more robust to noise, both random and adversarial. So here, for example, the task was to predict the brain age of a subject based on MRI data. And so for this task, it's particularly important to leverage the topological structure. And so TRL is a, the tensor regression layer is a particularly well adapted. So here we used a 3D residual network. So 3D ResNet 18. Um, in black is a regular network with flattening and fully connected layers. In magenta, we replace the flattening and fully connected layers with a tensor regression layer. And in green, we also applied tensor dropout to this um, tensor regression layer. And we added noise to the input to simulate the rich noise that naturally occurs during capture. And as you can see, if we add noise to uh, the input and pass it through a regular network, the error increases very quickly. But the tensor regression network, due to this regularizing effect, is naturally more robust. And if we also use tensor dropout, then there is a large region for which we can decrease the signal to noise ratio, so increase the noise, and not see a degradation in performance. So I've covered uh, a few of the techniques we can use to incorporate tensor methods within deep learning to obtain better methods. And so I just want to talk a little bit about practical implementations and how we can easily deploy these methods using Tensorly Torch, which is an open source library we developed in NVIDIA and that provides out of the box tensor layers. So Tensorly Torch builds on top of Tensorly and provides tensor methods in the form of PyTorch layers that you can directly incorporate in deep neural networks and that takes care of details such as initialization, et cetera. So as a case study, I want to show how we can apply it to the to kinetics-based large-scale video classification. So the kinetics data set is a large-scale uh, data set of more than 300,000 videos, about 10 seconds each, that were collected from YouTube and annotated in terms of 400 human action classes, such as playing an instrument or here playing cricket. So the goal is you get this video and you try to predict uh, what action is represented in that video. And a typical pipeline for video-based prediction is to first train in the image domain. So you try your, train your model to uh, classify images. Then you generalize that to videos, for example, using transduction on kinetics. And then you fine tune on your own task where you typically have less data. So it's really useful to have good models trained on this kinetic um, data sets. And so here, what we did is we started from regular pre-trained PyTorch uh, models, pre-trained on kinetics data set, which consists of about 33 million parameters. It's a 3D ResNet 18. And we simply compressed the convolution layers using Tensorly Torch by replacing them by these factorized convolutions I presented. So here we used a Tucker decomposition. And we then fine-tuned the factorized model for just a few epochs. And as you can see, as we can actually get quite good compression ratios like more than 30% without hurting accuracy. And actually for smaller compression ratios, say about 10%, we even get better performance thanks to the regularizing effects to the, of these tensor factorizations. And so we can also do the same on ImageNet. So here the goal is to classify images as a one of a, um, our, as in terms of different classes. Uh, and we trained a ResNet 152 where we replaced, again, the, factori uh, the convolutions by factorized convolutions. So in red is the original network. And in blue, we, did, we applied layer-wise factorization. So we factorized each layer separately. And we also applied a regularization to the rank, so an L1 regularization to the rank, which we called tensor lasso. And we alternatively tried compressing jointly several layers, so like the TNet I presented, in green. And as you can see, again, we can compress the network, get um, small increases in performance and with, yeah, and get also better robustness. So just to briefly show how you can do this in practice with code. So in PyTorch, that's how you would create a 2D convolution. You specify the number of input and output channels and the size of the kernel. And so in Tensorly Torch, it's the same, except you can do, you have to specify the order of the convolutions. 
So the order of the so the order of the convolutional kernel would actually be this order plus two because you also have output channels and input channels. You specify the rank of the decomposition you want to apply on this layer and the type of factorization. So here is CP. So you can either get these factorized layers from existing layer by decomposing uh, the pre-trained weight. Here, uh, rank equals 0 0.5 means we want to keep half the number of parameters. And you can also uh, factorize multiple layers jointly. And so this whole library kind of builds on the core concept of factorized tensors, which we want to be able to manipulate like they were regular tensors. So you can directly initialize the factorization so that the reconstruction has a normal distribution. And so in, um, initialization is particularly important for training neural networks to prevent gradient vanishing or exploding, for example. You can reconstruct the full tensor, or you can directly operate on the factorized tensor without reconstructing it, which would use a lot of memory and computation. And so we implemented most of the layers I presented here, including tensor regression layers, tensorized linear layers, etc. And you can augment any layer with tensor dropouts or tensor lasso. So tensor dropout would um, regularize and improve robustness, and tensor lasso can help also regularize, but also select the rank. So we've seen a wide range of applications of tensor methods to deep learning, but before I conclude, I just want to uh, say a few words about an exciting application of tensor methods, which is for quantum computation and quantum machine learning simulation. So quantum computation is a rapidly growing field and that seeks to solve difficult problems such as optimization and quantum chemistry or condensed matter simulation by leveraging large state spaces and dynamic interactions between states. However, the field is in many ways still currently limited to small noisy devices, which are very expensive to build. So as a result, it is believed that simulation is key to its development and still will be for at least a few years. And the main challenge is that while traditional computers operate on bits, the logical units of this quantum computing is the qubits. And so while they are traditionally expressed in matrix formalism, they are also naturally expressed in tensor structures. So an example of a operation that can be efficiently represented like this is the partial trace over portions of qubit registers, which has deep ties to study of noise, decoherence, and information metrics. And so using tensor methods, we can naturally speed up the simulation of quantum operations. And we're interested in exploring decomposed tensors to simulate low rank quantum states. And so um, Taylor Patty, who is currently doing an internship in our team, has been working on extending tensorly for quantum operations. And so in some preliminary experiments, we found that by building on top of tensorly, we're able to compute things like partial traces much more efficiently. So compared to the leading matrix formalism software, Qtip, we found that tensor-based computation was between 2 and 20x more efficient and 3 to 4x more memory efficient when run on um, CPU. And on GPU, these speedups can be are even higher and between 5x and 500x. And so generally, um, we found that optimization problems of most things we care about, so anything classical, have answers that lie in a simple product state without entanglement. And although there's a lot of belief that they can um, be better and more rapidly explored with at least some entanglement states, we want to explore the case where uh, we have uh, factorized tensors, so where the states are all factorized. So we're interested in solving uh, computationally challenging problems using factorized tensors and weights. No, I don't, I don't want to cut it short when you talk about quantum. Yeah. Time's kind of up. We had a few questions, but yeah, maybe if you can come to the conclusions here. Yeah, okay. Actually, that's um, the last slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so yeah, here basically we just uh, applied this to um, max cut problems where we have 20 qubits. So given a graph, we want to find the maximum cuts. And so here each layer, um, so here we have, we explored a few directions, uh, one directional in um, blue, uh, sorry, in green is where we have um, the minimum critical depth, such as um, all qubits get to control the, the lower qubits. Two directional is the same, but um, qubits influence their nearest neighbors on both directions. And uh, the deep case is we have more layers. And so, as you can see, we can efficiently optimize hard problems um, very efficiently with a relatively small number of parameters and still converge to good solutions. And so 
on, on the two graphs below, we kind of show the entanglement. So that's a rough measure of entanglement. And we take six qubits and measure the entanglement with the other 14 qubits. And so that's really interesting because we see that it's helpful to start with a higher entanglement. But as we uh, train the model, the entanglement naturally goes to zero, which makes sense because the solution is not quantum. We don't want any superposition. And so the, there is no entanglement in the answer. And so that's kind of an interesting direction showing that some entanglement is helpful for optimizing this kind of problems, but we can still leverage uh, low rank structures. So that's what I just mentioned. We found that low connectivity networks are typically uh, sufficient. We don't need too much uh, entanglement. And so this kind of low rank factorized structure that I presented in this talk are really useful there. And so, yeah, just to summarize, um, Tensor methods are really helpful in the context of deep learning for compression, speedups, generalization, and robustness. Um, we cannot develop this library, TensorLitosh, to make these uh, very easy to use. And um, that's all for me. I'll be very happy to answer any questions.